Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. This is AutoLine After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vasilash, episode 364 for February 9 of 2017, Nissan, NADA, and the Chicago Auto Show. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Welcome, everybody, to AutoLine After Hours. And Gary, we're not in the studio this no, way. we're not. We're in uh, quite, a, quite a big facility here. It uh, doesn't look any, and there's a Death Star behind us. So yeah. uh, we're certainly not in the studio. Death Star from Star Wars, uh, hovering right above us that's in right. the background. Rogue One. That, that's pretty good. And of course, we're using all that to predicate that we're at the Chicago Auto Show. We are. And uh, in fact, we also have as a special guest with us right now, Dave Sloan, he is the general manager for the Chicago Auto Show. And Dave, wait, welcome to After Hours. Thank you, welcome to the Chicago Auto Show. You know, if you talk about the various auto shows in uh, the U.S., you got Detroit, of course, it's the Motor City. You got L.A. because there's so many design studios and uh, uh, some of the Japanese automakers headquartered out there. New York, of course, the financial community. What would you describe to people who have never been to the Chicago Auto Show? What, what's kind of its calling card as a show? Well, it's big. Uh, we're in 1.1 million square feet. Uh, we have McCormick Place, so we love to try to fill it up. And we get to do things, especially on the show floor, that sh some shows just can't do, like all these indoor test tracks. Chrysler's got three, or FCA's got three indoor test tracks just in their display. They're in about 140,000 square feet. That's as big as some shows itself. So they're literally driving vehicles around it, isn't driving it? Driving vehicles up and down. Slot it's car. a Jeep off-road course, showing the capabilities of Ram trucks. Uh, and then they've got an acceleration lane, and they, they literally squeal tires <laughs> and, uh, and go zero to 30 to zero uh, and make you feel like you just went zero to 60 to zero. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty cool. So, so to give big in perspective, John mentioned three other auto shows. How does this compare to the size of those three other auto shows? Well, it, it's the biggest. Uh, I was talking earlier about McCormick Place, this place that we're blessed to have to hold the show. It's so big, we're only using a third of it. And, it, and so there are 2.7 million square feet at McCormick Place. You could have the Detroit, the New York, and the LA show held here simultaneously in their current size configuration. So it's a big facility. And, and the thing w that we're known for, that we really try to keep a focus on, to be the consumer auto show. That's how we think we can make the biggest impact for the industry. And so we've always been known as the place where you can go and see what America thinks of your car. You know, there's no, there's no, uh, uh, no loyalties here. Um, and so, uh, we really focused on that, and it and it works for us. We, What's the public attendance of Chicago versus, say, like New York or L.A.? The most. <laughs> never, <laughs> never bet your paycheck on the attendance claims of an auto show manager. <laughs> Let me just tell you that. <laughs> so, lies, damn lies, and auto show attendance numbers. Thank you right? very much. <laughs> but anyway... Um, we're, we try to do things. We're in February. Why would you be in February in Chicago? Because that's where we can make the most impact. This is a great place to be on a cold February day. There's not much else going on in the city, comparatively. And, and so we, the media supports us. We'll have five TV specials shot from the show floor. Um, and because the media, the advertising media, knows that if they deliver for the auto industry, in February, they'll get paid back all year long, the way advertising funds are generated in the industry. And so everything just works in February. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to worry about uh, sharing parking with the Bears uh, at Soldier Field. Um, we've got great parking facilities here, uh, train lines coming in. We can move a lot of people through these doors. Mm -hmm. so, so do you bring people from the tri-state area? I mean, Oh, it's, sure, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say, you know, uh, the west side of Michigan, 
Um, certainly Wisconsin and Iowa, yes. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and believe it or not, we're, we're really big in Northwest Indiana because when you think about it, it, McCormick Place on the south side of Chicago is more accessible to the suburbs of Chicago in Northwest Indiana than it is to some of the Northwest suburbs in, in Chicago. Mm -hmm. This has also sort of been known in the past as a truck show, that automakers would save their truck or SUV products. And do you see it that way? You know, we just try to amplify whatever message the automakers, our exhibitors are trying to promote. So we are wide open on that. And, uh, and we really do try to, to help them. Tomorrow, we'll, we'll do a day that's just focused on social media to try to use that medium to help our exhibitors get their message out. And we don't stop at, at the end of the media preview. We know that there are 10 days where this show floor is full of amazing stories and we can just keep pumping it out all week long. And uh, so it, it really works well. Now this is one of the venerable shows. It's been around for a while. How many, how many years? So this is the 109th Chicago Auto Show. We were the second one after New York. Uh, but we were the first to get started after World War II, so it's been held more times than any other auto show. Really? Yeah, yeah. That's quite a history. I want to thank you, Dave, for stopping by and giving us this little overview, overview of what the Chicago Auto Show is all about. Thank you very much. We're good. We're going to take a quick break. we got a whole lot more coming on AutoLine After Hours. There's only one talk show that covers the issues and executives that drive the auto industry. Turn to AutoLine this week, every Friday at AutoLine.tv or on your local PBS stations across America. AutoLine this week. You can't get more inside the industry. Well, we're back. We're at the Chicago Auto Show talking about all di different kinds of things. And I think we're going to be talking about Nissan right now because the guest that's joined us right now is Fred Diaz from Nissan, and Fred, great to have you on the show. Great to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. This is a truck show, and you're in charge of trucks for uh, for Nissan, and you guys uh, introduced a new new Titan this morning. A new Titan King Cab, our fifth of five that that we promised the world we would bring to market just a little over a year ago. It was it was December of the year prior, and we told the world when we launched our Cummins XD diesel that we were going to be coming out with five products over the course of the next year, and this is our last baby to hatch. If you so will. run us through quickly, what are those five? So it was the Titan XD with a diesel engine, then the Titan XD with a gas engine, then it was the 1500 or crew cab half ton, and then the single cab half ton, and now finally the king cab half ton. And king cab means what? It's king cab, big cabin. Essentially, well, what it is, it's, it's actually, uh, in some nomenclatures, it's called a quad cab. And what we have is a clamshell door opening. So there's a rear hinge on the back door, and it opens 172 degrees. So there is no B pillar. And essentially, when you slide the seats forward, you have a huge area to be able to slide your, your gear, your tools, whatever it may be in. Its primary use is, is commercial application and now we're very serious about getting into the commercial side of the business. So without that B-pillar, it, it just gives you incredible amounts of storage opportunity. Um, it's a commercial application, but you can also get the, the vehicle with a back seat or with a seat delete, no back seat, depending on what your application of choice is, either for personal use or for commercial use. Now, now with, the, with the four vehicles that you had in, in 2016, you guys did a phenomenal job, 80% growth in market from the year before? 80% growth and, and we've, uh, we're have we almost at 2% market share, which may not sound like much, but when you consider the fact that we were at less than 0.4 tenths of market share, that one and a half points of market share that we've gained, I guarantee you, any OEM in the truck business would give their left arm for a point and a half of market share. So very proud of our successes, very proud of our sales growth, very proud of the team and the hard work that we've put behind bringing these trucks to market, but certainly just scratching the surface. We have a long way to go. You do. I mean, even though it's 80% growth, the sales are still fairly small. It was, what, 21, 20, 22,000? Mm -hmm. um, but still, 80% growth is nothing to sneeze on, obviously. Of the four trucks that you had in the lineup, you, you probably didn't even have them for the full year, did you? Oh, no, not at all. So that's another factor that, that comes into it. We we intentionally intentionally had a very slow and steady ramp up because we wanted to make sure that 
if there were any quality issues or anything that we could see that, that wasn't just right, that we could make the tweaks, make the changes, shift on the fly, and make sure that we didn't deliver anything that was problematic in the marketplace. So, how did the diesel do for you guys? The diesel's done really, really well. So, two things. Part of the reason that we launched with that vehicle first is because we knew that it would give us the, the best ability to have that very, very slow, methodical ramp up from a manufacturing standpoint so that we could get our bearings about us, if you will, when it comes to producing a truck and producing a great quality truck. And then secondly, what we desperately needed as a brand, because it had been 13 years since we had brought a truck to market, we needed street cred. And by putting a Cummins turbo diesel engine into our truck, that gave us the street credibility that we needed for people to start creating that awareness and saying, I need to take a look at this truck. Not just any old truck is going to have a Cummins diesel engine in, in under the hood. What was the, the take rate? What was the mix with diesel in the heavy duty end? The take rate was 30% on no the diesel. No kidding. Yeah, so it was pretty high. We were very, very happy to see that. So and, and I say that because up to now, Dodge has been the best, and I think they were getting, a, what, about a 20%? I believe mix, that's correct. Maybe about 20. So if you got 30%. We were very happy with that. Very happy with how, how well it sold. 4x2, four 4x4. Four four. Uh, it was about a 50-50 split there. So we were very pleased with, with how well the, the diesel application took off for us. Fred, let me ask you. So, so you spent some time in Detroit, and you know how brutal the truck market is oh, yeah. in terms of those three other companies in particular. Why do people look at the Nissan Titan? Well, I think what we've delivered is we've delivered first a good looking truck, secondly a quality truck, and of course the innovations that we've put into the truck both in the interior and exterior, I think people are surprised by what we've delivered. And then most importantly because we knew that how competitive this, this market is, I mean if I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times to the people as you build the team and, and you rally the team towards this big thing that we're about to come to market with. It's, Boys and girls, we better put your big boy pants on because this market plays for keeps and they don't mess around. So get ready for war. Mm -hmm. And essentially that's kind of the whole mindset that, that, that we've uh, transitioned into as we've gone through this renaissance of change, both at the corporate level and at the dealer level. And having that warranty, a five year, 100,000 mile bumper to bumper warranty is that, that special something that gets the most loyal buyer in the entire automotive industry, a truck buyer, fiercely loyal to their brand. But when you give them something like that that sends a huge quality message about how much we believe in the quality of our truck, it makes people stop and think and say, I need to check this truck out to see what's what's going on. Are you conquesting buyers or are you just pulling in are, old Titan buyers? We, we are pleasantly surprised. All of our forecasts that we had relative to the conquest that we would get from the domestic autom automakers as well as Toyota have uh, far surpassed our, our so wildest can expectations. Can you give us some numbers on that? I mean, what uh, <clears throat> I'll share some quick numbers. We do have a good amount, I would say, in the high 30s of customers that have either driven a Titan, have driven a Frontier, or have a Nissan in their stable, in their garage, and they are coming back to us. So we have a great base of loyal customers that come back to us that really believe in, passionately about the Nissan brand. The balance, 60%, are coming from the domestics and from Toyota. So we're very, very happy about those numbers that we're seeing coming back, and, and it's just been happy to see that we've been very, very fortunate to see those numbers. Now you mentioned the Frontier. Um, that's a truck that's been out there for a very long mm -hmm. time, and, and uh, GM is, is doing very well with the new midsize. Are you guys thinking about uh, something in that space? The midsize segment is exploding. Uh, we're definitely looking and studying all kinds of options as to where we want to go with the future of the Frontier. In the meantime, we have the best value story and we have a truck that's that's been around for so long that it's absolutely bulletproof. So the truck is doing really well. We're very happy to see how well that truck is doing with that explosion of that midsize truck segment. In fact, Gary, you so, got the numbers, right? Yeah, what, you, what was you, the, you, the They increased 38.4% uh, last year. Yep. yep. And of course- with The truck the, that's virtually unchanged. Right. Right? So, I mean, <clears throat> we're very happy about that. That speaks of, to what you were just saying, Fred, of how hot that segment is. It's, it's a hot segment and we have a great value proposition and people know that the quality of the truck is fantastic. And you also have the, the Nissan NVs in the, yes. in the truck segment. Yes. And uh, so you guys did the uh, Cargo X project. Can you, can you tell us about <laughs> that? Right that's, that's, that's wild. It's, uh, well, we have, a, we have a full stable of body on frame vans 
And one of the big marketing pushes that, that were, in addition to the fact that we have the 5100 bumper to bumper warranty, is the fact that this thing is, like I've said before, bulletproof. It's, it's strong as a bull. So what we did is we took this van and we put a Cummins turbo diesel engine and we put a four wheel drive system and then we took this thing off road and just beat the you know what out of it for, for many, many months and, and it held up, it never had a hiccup whatsoever. So we decided to bring it here to let people see how tough our, our trucks are and why our vans are and why we stand behind them. And the other message that I delivered this morning when we launched the King Cab was the fact that now before people would buy our vans. But one of the problems we had is, geez, you know guys, we love your vans, but we really hate to have to buy vans from you and trucks from somewhere else. We want one-stop shopping. Now that we have a full stable of trucks to complement our vans, now we are serious contenders in the commercial business from trucks to vans, and that's a big push. Fred, I got a question regarding the small commercial vans. Mm -hmm. Your NV200, yes. I was looking at the Ford Transit Connect and, 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 and the <clears throat> others that are at ProMaster City and all that. And they were red hot all last year until I want to say like the September time frame or something. And it's like someone threw a switch and sales of all of them started dropping. And I just wondered, do you have any insight as to what the hell's going on in the market? Well, I, I will tell you that our NV200 continues to be hot as a rocket. As a matter of fact, last month, we last year was our all-time record for NV200. It was the most NV200s we'd ever sold in a single year. And in the month of January, we had 25.4% 25, 25 market share in that segment. So our NV200 is, is white hot. Um, I need to do some more studies to find out what's going on in the segment in general, because I am aware that the market is down 33%, uh, but we keep doing well. So I think we've, I know one of the anecdotal comments I get all the time from the people that buy our vans is that warranty is hard to beat. So, and your van is a great van. So between the two, uh, we're in. Was that sort of taking a page out of Hyundai's book? You know, when a decade ago they started their 10 year 100,000 and it put people on the shopping yep. list. Yep, I mean, certainly we use that, that case study as, as we did our homework and we did our analysis, but, but more of it was from the perspective of, we need to give people a serious reason to consider our trucks. And we used the analysis from our vans because we had already we had that warranty on our vans already. <clears throat> so we knew how well it performed, how well it worked with our vans, and, and we put the business case together for why we needed to apply it to our trucks. And then you had a full portfolio of vehicles that all had the same warranty. So it makes it easy for your business certified dealers to be able to convince business to business buyers as to why they need to come shop us. Fred, Fred, do you have the Murano and Rogue under you, or is that a I do not. No, those are considered light trucks, but but they don't fall under me. My my specialty areas are trucks and, and all of our commercial vans. Mm -hmm. So anything that could be commercial, is that right, would uh, fall under you? From a you? van perspective. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could argue that all of our vehicles are up for commercial sale, but my focus is specifically trucks and vans. Mm -hmm. So with the NV200, are you finding people buying them for passenger vehicles or is it largely the commercial use? No, we don't even have a passenger vehicle oh, really? offering in the NV200, it's purely a New York City application. cabs. Well, of course, that, that's a that's a different, <laughs> that's a whole yeah, yeah. different, whole different <laughs> animal. commercial application. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, that's right. Yeah, but it is a commercial application and, and very happy, very pleased with how that New York ca taxi is doing for us. It's uh, It's been fantastic and to build a relationship with, with the fleet buyers, with the medallion owners, with the um, Metropolitan Board of Transit and Trade, uh, with, the, with the Taxi and Limousine Commission, with all, our, all of our dealers in Manhattan. It's just a, a collaboration of great people that, that just want to do business and take care of their customers. Mm -hmm. so, so you have a whole suite of vehicles like this from the smaller up to the larger. That's correct. Are, are, are you looking at, uh, you know, Ford is, is um, using the chariot vehicles in, in, in San Francisco and some other cities now to, to carry people around. Would that be a possible application for you guys? Yeah, I, don't, I don't know that I'd, I wouldn't speculate as to whether it would be a possible opportunity. I just know that we've got a lot of things in the hopper right now that, that we're considering and that we're looking at for future commercial applications. Mm -hmm. Well, good. Fred Diaz, thanks for stopping by here Thank at the Chicago Auto Show, me. bringing us up to speed with everything that Nissan's doing with trucks in the U.S. market. You bet. Great seeing you again. Good Thank deal. You. We're going to take a quick break right now. We're going to give a shout out to our friends at Bridgestone. 
Okay, we're back for yet another segment of AutoLine After Hours. Joining us right now is Mike, Mark Scarpelli. He is, let's see if I get this all right. He's uh, a car dealer. Yes. He also has run the Chicago Auto Show, where, yes, which is where we're at several times. And just a couple of weeks ago was made chairman of the National Automobile Dealers Association. Congratulations well, on you. that. Thank That's a big much. move. It is, I'm, I'm proud. It's quite an honor as an automobile dealer. It truly is. So because we're at the show and because you've been in charge of this several times, um, there are some people who speculate that auto shows are on the wane. What's your, what's your sense of that? Well, you know, there's, there's quite a difference between uh, the Chicago Auto Show and, and many other auto shows around the country. This particular show is the largest square foot show in the country. So it's billed as the largest consumer show. And in the Midwest, uh, many people from uh, many states all around the region come here to look at an automobile. This is actually a show where you can get inside the car and, and touch and feel and smell the automobile. So it's a vital part of our industry and our economy here. Uh, attendance keeps going up at the Chicago Auto Show. Uh, I can tell you that the auto show is alive and well in Chicago and, mm -hmm. and we keep building and it. it's, it's quite an event. We have four test tracks here this year. So it's, it's a wonderful show, it really is. So do you find that people who attend the auto show end up at your dealership in a week or two later? Absolutely. And this is, this is the start of the, the spring buying season or selling season, whatever side of the table you're at. <laughs> Ma many people you know, buy a new automobile, truck, SUV, whatever, after they come to the show. Mm -hmm. it, it inspires, you know, I mean, you, you walk around, there's rolling test beds for uh, computers, uh, your, your, your cell phones attached to these new cars, SUVs. It's, it's inspiring. It's mm -hmm. pretty exciting, actually. Right. Mark, I'm curious what some of the discussion was at NADA, the big convention that you sure. guys just had a couple of weeks ago, because every time I turn around, automakers are saying we're fast approaching the time where people will no longer buy cars. They're going to, mm. going to buy their mobility instead. We see ride-sharing companies like Uber and Lyft exploding in terms of growth, and right around the corner is going to be autonomous cars. Well, what are dealers talking about? with this whole move to mobility? Well, here's what I will tell you. For the two hats that I wear as uh, being chairman of NADA and also an automobile dealer, NADA perspective nationwide, we are very concerned about affordability of new automobiles. The average price of an automobile in America today is $34,000. So you add on layers of federal regulation, whether it be pollution control or EPA mandates, that price of that automobile is going to gravitate up past $36,000, $37,000. So affordability is, is key. So we want to make sure at an association to make sure that cars and trucks are affordable for, for average consumers, for the American public. So that being said, the rest of it, as far as autonomous vehicles and driverless automobiles, you know, uh, that's an evolution. It's happening. Uh, as we just got out of a conference earlier today, it's happening. And will it happen? It, it's going to happen. I, I, th I think it's, it's not quite ready for prime time yet. When you think about the automobile fleet that's on the road today, there's 64,000 plus, excuse me, 64 million cars on the road today. To, to run through that fleet, and to get these autonomous vehicles on the road, that's going to be number one feat. Number two feat is the infrastructure, the, auto, the uh, roads, the bridges, the tunnels in America, which uh, admittedly all of us will say are crumbling, are not in great shape. To have all of that done, that we're not ready for prime time yet. It, it's going to come. And how about the rural community, the people out in, in the, the uh, rural areas in America? Again, so we're getting there, and it's exciting. And we'll evolve, and it's, it'll be an exciting time for all of us. So either as an individual dealer or as an NADA um, representative, um, what is your sense of younger people? Are younger people interested in going to dealerships? Is, is, it, is it different for you guys now? And, and how has it changed? Well, I'll tell you, I've been in the, the business my whole life. Um, first job was pushing a broom at our dealership, so I've seen a whole bunch of stuff go on, right? I can tell you in the last five years, it really has evolved. Um, you know, everybody's got a smartphone. We have customers now who, uh, the, the statistic used to be a uh, consumer would come into a car dealership and shop four or five places, right? Now today it's, it's uh, maybe one visit or one and a half visits. So that really has come down. Well, why the change? Consumers are more educated. They can shop in their, their home computers. They can shop on their, their uh, smartphones in the dealership. We actually have seen, surprise, surprise, folks in our showroom while negotiating 
uh, for a new car on their cell phone, on their phone, negotiating with another dealership online <laughs> at the same process. So we're multitasking. Uh -huh. So, you know, with it, that's the evolution of it. And, it, it, you know, it, it's happening. And in our world, it, it's great to have a educated consumer, and it's also great to have uh, services uh, to offer to customers, such as pickup delivery, pit stops, uh, great waiting lounges, uh, more dependable cars, extended warranties. So the, the industry is, is becoming very reactive to consumers' needs and to, to younger people coming in the market. I, I, I think they're actually enjoying the process a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Dealers seem to be a little bit under threat, you know, because of Tesla. Wants to sell direct, does not want to use franchise dealers. There's a Chinese company that says it wants to be in the U.S. market by 2019. The, the parent company is called Geely. The brand they're going to bring to the American market is Link & Co. as in company. What's your thought of where this is all going to go? I, clearly, you know, as we were just talking about a younger generation of consumers, Everybody just wants to buy things online, make it simple, easy breezy. Where, what do you think is going to happen with this? Well, I, I can tell you, I think we touched on it earlier. I, I think it's all about choices for people going forward. People want choices. I want choices. I'm a consumer. When I go out and buy a, whatever I buy, I want choices. You'd probably get a good deal. Well, <laughs> you know, by the same token, they want choices. But, you know, speaking specifically about cars, you know, the big OEMs, um, and you mentioned some of the other manufacturers, the fleets that those big OEMs, Detroit Big Three and uh, European and Asian car makers, have millions of cars on the road, millions. Not 10,000, not 15,000. So if you're a consumer and th that car needs attention or you've got to go in and, and talk to a representative of the company, well, at this point in time, well, you, you're going to talk to an agent on the telephone or you're going to talk to them online. At the end of the day, the, the consumer is, is key. We want to make sure that the consumer is taken care of. So that model is evolving. It's, it's low volume, so they can take care of the eight to 10,000 folks who have bought the automobile or the, the, the uh, vision of selling cars online, and it may evolve, and maybe it'll, it'll happen. But if you've got millions of cars on the road, you need, uh, you need people on the ground, you need a footprint, you need uh, folks to take care of, whether it be a service issue, uh, picking out colors or, or picking out, everybody likes selection, right? Mm -hmm. Our dealerships, we have over 1,000 cars on the ground, new cars. So, it, you know, kind of, if, if we don't have the color, maybe it's, it's not made. So people like choices. That's what that, that's all about. Mm -hmm. And that's how we cater. So, so Mark, do you find that, you know, we, we mentioned younger people before. I mean, so we're all approximately of a certain age. And, and so when we grew up, you know, cars were really aspirational. We sure. really wanted a car and, and we really knew what we wanted and mm -hmm. couldn't wait to do it. Are, are you finding that young people are as engaged today as perhaps the earlier generation was? You know, it, it all depends on what perspective they're, they're coming from. I, I can tell you that our, our group of dealerships is, is not metro areas. I, I will tell you more urban type areas. I, I'm sure that there's a little less interest in, in automobiles, uh, suburbs and rural areas. Absolutely, it's alive and well. Our, our dealerships are in those areas mm -hmm. and it's, it's refreshing to see a 16, 17 year old coming in with mom and dad or saving money looking for a nearly new car or a pre-driven car or a, you know, it still happens. It happens mm -hmm. every day. It so, really does. So, so, I mean, mentioning the um, previously owned vehicles, I mean, the, the upside is that cars today are of higher quality and I mean, presumably last longer. I mean, how, how does that affect dealerships, the, the uh, used car market? Well, you know, uh, it, it, the, uh, mm -hmm the, the uh, lifespan of, of that car is greater than it had been for sure. So it, it all depends on the previous owner, has it been taken care of, you know, the maintenance part of it for sure. You mentioned the warranty is longer. So people do hang on to their automobiles a little bit longer. At the end of the day, it's still about, there's a bunch of folks who want to be first in tenders, want the new latest greatest, even if it is a pre-driven car. Mm -hmm. And they might be upgrading a, a, an eight-year-old car to a a six-year-old car or a three-year-old car. Mm -hmm. So you, you still have that movement with different designs, different colors, um, so it's, it still happens. Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated to see that there's a couple of luxury brands, Lincoln, not Lincoln Co., the, the Lincoln we all know, and Genesis. 
who see a competitive advantage in telling any potential buyer, you never have to go to the dealership. <clears throat> we'll handle everything. You tell us where, we'll come to your office, we'll come to your home, we'll go get a cup of coffee. Sure. If you need service, if you need anything, you never have to go to the dealership again. And they see that as a competitive advantage. That's how they're trying to you know, brush aside the other big luxury players. W where does that take dealers in the future if part of the selling proposition is you never have to go to the dealer? Sure, you know, uh, you mentioned a couple brands in their uh, niche markets for sure. And uh, we're talking um, some, some lower volume things. So, you know, if, if you're talking eight, 10,000 automobiles, uh, that service and that level of service can probably be maintained. When you get into big volume things as some of the, the big three manufacturers, it's gonna be a difficult task. On the other hand, these big manufacturers and, and uh, dealerships that have big brands, they are evolving too. They have pickup and delivery service, um, all of those things that you just mentioned. So it's evolving, it'll happen, it'll happen. The one thing about automobile dealers and one thing about OEMs, bigger OEMs, we have evolved, we will survive, and we're ready to move forward with, with the market because without uh, having a vision and, and progressing in the market, we won't be here. Mm. We will be here, I guarantee you we will. Well, good. With that, that's probably a great place to wrap this up. But Mark, thanks so much for stopping by Thank on so Online much. After Hours. Really Thank appreciate you. it. We're going to come back in a moment. We've got even more to talk about, but we're going to give a shout out right now to our friends at Lear. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts. All delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. We're back for yet another segment on AutoLine After Hours, joined by two colleagues of ours. We've got Kirk Bell and Paul Bryan, and Paul, you're with who? Uh, ABC owned and operated stations group. Now explain that a little bit, just so uh, Disney, thumbnail. Disney ABC owned stations at uh, eight markets around the country and, and we supply them with their video content for reviews and things like that. Cool, and Kurt? I'm senior editor with Motor Authority and I also work with Green Car Reports and The Car Connection. And yeah. the other thing is, is they're both Chicago guys. Yes. That's why we got them so on watch the your kneecaps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's that part of the show where we bring Dr. Data in. All right. So, Doctor, what's the number? Okay, so here's here's the number, and it has something to do with you guys would be perhaps closer to this than John or I would be. It's it's a four, Chicago number. Four million seven hundred seventy-five thousand four hundred and fourteen. Okay, I'm going to throw out a guess. I'm going to say that's the population of the city of Chicago proper. No, that's no. too big. That's too big. It's, yeah. it's, an no, automotive, it's automotive related, so it's not a number uh, that I just pulled out of the... Uh, number of vehicles sold in the Chicago ADI. No. Kurt, anything? I, I think You know what? I got okay. nothing. It's the number of vehicles registered in the state of Illinois. Oh, and sold, the, registered. Okay, registered. Well, you're going to make me a liar. You're on the right, right track. But, 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 but for the entire that. state. But the thing that was astonishing to me is to find out that, that Illinois is actually number five in terms of car registrations. Okay, so there's Texas, or California, Texas, Florida, New York, and Illinois. Now, John, what astonished me was the state of Michigan, where we're from, is 10th on the list. So here we have the Chicago Auto Show. I mean, there's a hell of a lot of cars and trucks that yeah, can sell in this area. Yeah, you know, and, and this show has traditionally been, well, you know what? It actually changed its composure uh, once Red Poling and all the guys and, and Keith Crane and everybody sat in Detroit and said, we need to make Detroit the international show. Chicago was always the big show in the country. And then those guys kind of sat around and said, eh, you know what, it should really be here and let's rebrand the pro uh, product and everything else. And, uh, and they did a very effective job of it. And, and working under less than uh, optimal conditions that Cobo Hall provides. Mm -hmm. so, so, okay, you know, you're talking about the history of this show. And the thing that I always wonder about is, is that why is this a truck-centric show more than a car-centric show? 
That's a good question. I don't. What well, beats me, Lieutenant? I, I think the thinking always was, oh, it's the Midwest, you know, pickups, you know, and Chicago, the bigger show. So, I think a lot of uh, automakers just started introducing trucks here, and and then they that followed. Toyota has a a history of introducing trucks here, and Ram has a history of introducing yeah. trucks here. Dodge before that, so it started being that way, and then. LA started being green and mm -hmm. uh, you know so so sometimes shows just sort of take on that persona right and uh, it just sort of becomes tradition because it was that way before but I don't I don't think I, if you're gonna do trucks you should do it in Texas more than you should do it yeah here. right yeah but they don't have a show that comes close to this show though <clears throat> they have uh, the Texas State Fair where they do actually quite a few truck introductions uh, nowadays. yeah I know but I'm just telling you about the number of people that come to the show you know right. the, the, yeah. at, at Texas State Fair it's a little bit different uh, you know a different mentality on this I mean this here you've got an island event that's going on in the middle of a horrible season really and people are sitting here at home going what in the world am I going to do and so they say well auto shows going on let's mosey down to McCormick place and do that uh, and and if if those shows have personas like uh, one's a car show one's a truck show one's whatever this has always been the, the overall consumer show and and where this show differentiates itself from from for instance Detroit is that a, it's larger. B, the number of people who come to this show are not influenced by the industry. It's it's a, a more pure universe of general consumers than anyone else. They aren't tied to the industry. Right. They're interested in looking yeah. at what cars they might buy next. Yeah. So, so did you guys see any cars or trucks here introduced that you would consider to be viable? Viable? Oh, desirable. Um, well, uh, two in particular for me, uh, I think that the Durango SRT is very fun and cool. Now, how much of a family vehicle that is but that might not get you very good <laughs> fuel economy is one thing, but 475 horsepower out of a uh, three-row SUV is mm -hmm. awfully fun. Um, but the Elantra GT has 55 cubic feet of cargo space inside, and you can get it with 201 horsepower and have a car that's fun to drive mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, you know a viable little uh, hatchback that could fill in for your compact SUV mm -hmm. so I think that's a that's a fun one mm -hmm. and an, and an, and an interesting and a, and a, a value play too right yeah Paul uh, the, the, the timing is such that we're recording uh, right when they're introducing the uh, uh, Chrysler uh, Pacifica Hellcat <laughs> Right. Yeah, I, right. I wasn't aware of uh, Hellcat uh, Pacifica. A, uh, seven, Darn it, we're missing the big news of the show. Seven horsepower minivan. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the only thing. Right. You know, as Kirk says, the, the Durango with that much power is pretty, pretty hard to keep your mouth from watering and something like that. And it's great fun. Uh, the, the, the Volvo wagon, I think, is still a, a wonderful car. You know, I you know, with so many people going to sport utility vehicles, the to see. A more traditional station wagon in their lineup. I know, but it's only automotive journalists who are interested in that thing. I mean, it's the the numbers are so small for sales in the U.S. I, I, I think it's I cool know. too. Don't get me you wrong, see, you but asked it's me like what was cool. You didn't ask me what was yeah, universal. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. That's true. So it was, you know, back to your point of the uh, the Durango with that with that big engine, um, zero to sixty in four point four seconds. In a, in a vehicle that weighs like two and a half tons. I mean, it's just <laughs> Actually, we have, a, we have an interesting story on that because um, that was set at a drag strip uh, with lots of nice rubber on the track, mm -hmm. probably ideal conditions, probably a pro racer at the wheel. And if you go on uh, Jeep's website and look at the Grand Cherokee SRT, which weighs a little bit less, their zero to 60 is 4.8 with the same engine, same drivetrain. So how did that happen? Um, so I think when you when you're using better traction conditions, maybe that you and I won't get a 4.4. Even so, anything sub five seconds in a it three gets row your, SUV. Gets your attention. <laughs> right, mm -hmm. right. That's pretty crazy. There's so, been. Go ahead, Gary. No, I was, was going to say so. So Toyota showed some some new TRD mm -hmm. variant trucks today. You yeah, guys, Rav4 Adventure. Rav4 Adventure, yeah. yeah. 
uh, which yeah. which is kind of interesting. It's kind of a little bit confusing. One piece of data they gave said it was only going to be front wheel drive, and the other said it was going to be both front and all wheel drive. And I think that uh, it's uh, both. Yeah. They said both during the news conference. Yeah, it's raised ride height. I don't know why you'd do why you'd buy a raised ride height For front, front wheel drive, drive vehicle, car. but yeah. Uh, you want an off-road look, so it would be better to go all-wheel drive. Yeah. Yeah. And and what's the deal with with all of these these companies coming out with things that have to do with the Ram HD Night, and and Nissan has the what is it the Midnight Edition? This of appears all their to vehicles. be the show of black trim. <laughs> that was that what it is? <laughs> yeah. And is there a reason for that? Yeah. It's, uh, there's like four or five different automakers that have introduced black trim as their new product at uh -huh. this show and. I don't really get it, but uh, uh -huh. black wheels, black trim. Maybe we're all in the wrong uh, age, but you know, I have still never embraced all of the black wheels and, and Amen. black hats. Amen. I, I don't you know, like the look I of it. I come from the Roger Penske school, that if it's a race car, it should have shiny wheels on it, by God. I don't mind the black wheels. It's oh. just, it, if it has if it has cool looks and black wheels, maybe it should have a little performance to go with it. And a, a Mitsubishi LE model that has black wheels and so 148 the, horsepower is exactly. the substance with the statement. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. And the thing that I thought was very bizarre about the uh, Ram HD Night is that it's, it's available in the following colors: bright silver metallic. Hmm. It's nightly <laughs> about that. Bright white, Delmonico it's, red it's pearl, dark white. I want granite dark white. crystal metallic. But there is a brilliant black crystal. So of of the colors, there's only one that signifies night. Well, maybe if you put a K at the front, then yeah. night and silver yeah. would make sense. And, and we're in Chicago, <laughs> and seeing that David Hasselhoff is from Chicago, oh, is he? from LaGrange, Illinois, mm -hmm. Lions Township High School. Night <laughs> Rider. Buddy, buddy of mine from high school. Uh, yeah, I'm sure it was. Is he your buddy? Yeah. Wow. Oh. Yeah. No wonder you know all these it's details. A resume item. Yeah, this close to celebrity. <laughs> no, he's, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. I'm very proud of him for getting things back together. He went through some tough times, but he pulled it back together, and he's doing real well. I hope he doesn't go back to talking to a Pontiac Firebird. <laughs> That's that. If he can find one, he can, he can buy one from I Bird have. Reynolds. He well, you know, show it may not be a Firebird, but we're all going to be talking to cars because yeah. that's where it's all going, voice activation. Yes. I don't, I don't know that I'm all that comfortable you know, talking to my car. Usually when I do it, it's... Uh, Swearing at it? Yes. <laughs> okay. You know, and I had to learn to swear in German, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't understanding me. <laughs> yeah. There's a, is it, do you guys ever get fed up with all the tech on oh, cars? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I get into a car, and I just want to shut it all off. And I want other people to have it, but I don't want it. <laughs> you know? I want I'll, it to be easy. I don't want to go three steps through a menu to just to change the radio station. Yeah. Well, things like lane departure warning and assist and, and uh, forward collision warning. Forward collision warning is always a good thing because yeah. if, you, if you miss that, that moment when that car in front of you stops and it stops for you, well, now you're not going to have an accident. But I can usually steer for my own lane. You know, I'm sick of steer, cars just trying to steer for me. But that other person on his cell phone who's not paying attention I prefer that they have it, mm -hmm. you know. So, I guess these things are good when in a society that's more and more distracted. And it is, you know. We're seeing uh, fatalities, traffic fatalities go up, and uh, in cars that are safer. In cars that are safer, right? Yeah, so, we, were, we were talking about this on the uh, uh, BMW 5 Series launch program. At, at what point do you take a car that has built itself for a long time, a brand that has built itself, as the ultimate driving machine? And when you start adding this technology over another, or another, 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 do you abrogate your responsibilities as a driver and do you stop being the ultimate driving machine and you start being the ultimate, I'm going to sit back and let the car drive me machine? It is the ultimate driving machine, it's driving itself. Oh, that's, that's it. Yeah. Ultimate Not riding machine. Ultimate driver's machine. I got it, I got it. Yeah, no, but the point you raise is a good one because uh, there's no question that cars are taking more and more control. Although I got to tell you, it's enthusiasts like us who discuss this stuff. For the general public, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, if a car is going to prevent them from getting in an accident, they're all for it. 
I, th I think that there's a comfort level that people assume when they purchase certain vehicles, and I think we've all seen this in Volvo owners for a, a long, long time. They felt that if they bought this car, there was, there was safety beyond what everybody else had that was going to come along with that car. And it's almost as if they were ceding their responsibility of being a good driver to the systems that were built into the car. And, and I, I just, I don't like the disconnect. I don't like that I'm trusting the car that much. For it can be a marketing problem. Like you can't necessarily, like Tesla did, call it autopilot and then people think they can sit in the back seat and let the car drive yeah. itself. Yeah. You know, the, so that's not, that's not smart, you know? And we saw videos on YouTube of people doing that kind doing of thing. Doing stupid things, yep. No question about it. Who would have ever thought that? <laughs> <laughs> so do you, guys, do you guys think there'd be a possibility that, that an automaker would sort, instead of like adding all of this stuff, piling it on top of one another, that somebody would come out and, and basically have a stripper car that, that had none of it? And, and Zill that, and it, Lada. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that's going to be your sports car. car. You drive. Sports cars? <laughs> He's yeah. good, yes. Your sports cars are going to stay that way. Uh, you know, Porsche is going to have the Panamera have all that, but uh, and the Cayenne and probably the Macan, but the 911 is going to fight it for a, a long time, I would think, in the, in the 718. Mm -hmm. The only automaker that's really talking along the lines of what you're saying, Gary, is Mazda, you know, who's driving, or whose advertising tagline now is driving matters. And they, they've pretty much come out and said, we're never going to do autonomy. You know, that's what they're saying now. Let's see what they're, they're right. saying in another 10 years. But I think there will be a niche in the marketplace for those who say, no, I want to be in control. I don't want the car to take control completely. And there's still going to be some regulations and the like where I, I believe we are going to have, you know, forward collision warning with full stop, you know, pedestrian detection mandated. In fact, the regulations already in, in line for that to happen. Nonetheless, I think there is going to be an opportunity for someone to say, not our car. You know, we're going to put the bare minimum possible into it and you are going to drive it. But let's throw something else in there, then, which is the tort bar. Let's enter the tort bar into that same discussion. And let's say that you, you make the conscious decision to not include those systems on your car and something happens. And then here comes uh, tort lawyer uh, Jones and he says, wait a minute, did you guys know about this technology? Well, yeah, a lot of people in the industry had it. So you made the active choice of not putting this technology that could have made this accident go away, could have prevented this death, could have prevented mayhem and everything else, but you chose not to. Well, then that manufacturer's got to sit there and he's going, well, yeah, we did, but, you know, so then this guy is going to go to some court and he's going to find some jury that's going to agree with him. So you think it's inevitable that this technology yeah, I think, is going to I, I think there's a way around people it. Who put it in defensively. I think there's a way around it. Now, look, there's certain safety items that are mandated. You have to put it in. There's other stuff that you can put in if you want, but I think the way around it is in the sales contract or with a sticker on the dashboard, it says <laughs> this car does not have this, this, and this safety equipment, and you sign the contract where our sales rep made it very clear it doesn't have all these gizmos on it. I think that's how you can get around it. We're certainly not there yet because a lot of these things are on higher end models. If you want to, you know, if you want some of this stuff, it's not even available. If I want the forward collision warning with a pedestrian detection, I can't get it till the $35,000 version, right. and I want the $25,000 version. So, um, and it would be nice if it were just available a la carte if you did want that, but they put it in the Grand Touring and not the, not the LE model, right. whatever. So, yeah, I, I get your point, but it, yeah. it's certainly so, not so there the, yet. Does that tort lawyer then sue the owner rather than the manufacturer? Because the owner said, well, oh, oh, wait a minute, you could have bought that, couldn't you? I don't know, but All right, Paul, you, Paul you, you were talking about learning how to swear in German before, and, and so Kurt, there was a, there was a news <laughs> item that came out this week that that came out of Germany with uh, the Volkswagen uh, uh, board and, and executives. Can you tell us about that? Well, uh, uh, Piech from Volkswagen uh, said that he former told, chairman, former chairman, still yeah. biggest shareholder yeah, in the company. Remember. Yeah, and uh, which is the odd part because he he said that. He had told the board in uh, in March of 15, 2015. That, he told them, "Hey, we're the, cheating." That uh, the, there were defeat defeat devices in the in the diesels, and um, 
this is of course about nine months perhaps but after the WVU study that proved that there was something going on. So Western May Virginia University, for those who don't know the yeah. acronym. No. And, yes, thank you. And that's odd because why didn't that go up the ladder before that anyway? So that would be a question that I would have. But um, so the odd part is he's, he's, he appears to be trying to throw Martin Wintercorn under the bus. The right guy now. who replaced him. Right. Who he fought to prevent from taking that position. Yes. <laughs> but what it also does is perhaps uh, ruin the, the value of the stock of which he owns a lot of. So I guess he can afford to do that. So, so, so basically, it did. It didn't. They didn't admit it until September of fifteen. So, and then it came out in November. And to so the he's, he's basically. So he's no, no, no. It came out in September. September. Out in September. It was li literally right. just days after the Frankfurt Auto Show okay, in right. September of twenty fifteen. Yes. Okay. So, so the concept here is that basically the board knew, but they were just keeping it quiet for purposes of keeping the stock value up, or. That's a good question. Why would that? Well, you, yeah. you hope nobody finds out, I guess, well, if remember, you're cheating. There is a stockholder class action lawsuit against the company for that very reason. They're only looking at two weeks where the board and top management absolutely unquestionably knew about defeat devices. Yeah. And so what this uh, shareholder lawsuit says is, whoa, you, you had to let us know that this was going on. So there's a big lawsuit over, but it's only over those two weeks. And, you know, you raised a really good point. The, the WVU test that uncovered all this cheating was done in 14. All the data was presented to Volkswagen. And, yeah, to your point, this did not go to the top level of the company. It's very interesting what Martin Wintercorn is saying because his wording is very carefully chosen. He says, I never heard about defeat devices oh, okay. until the two weeks before they went public with it. Well, they didn't call it a defeat device inside the company. They referred to, what was it, acoustic tests, I think it was. Well, we got some issues with the acoustic tests here. And That's so- right. They did have that euphemism. That they right, were. so f I find it fascinating how Wintercorn is, uh, is you know, sticking to this I never learned about a defeat device until the two weeks before the whole board and everybody knew about it. Wow. I think he knew about it way before that. They just didn't call it a defeat device. Well, obviously, everybody has to stick to what their lawyers are telling them That's to right. stick to at this right. point. So, so do, you yeah. guys, do you guys see an effect of all of that on sales of Volkswagen in the U.S. going Apparently forward? Apparently not. They're, they're doing pretty well. Well, they had a good month going last forward? month. Yeah. yeah. Well, do you? We know that thus far that the third generation of that diesel, there has been a, an approval to fix that engine. In the three liter? No, in on, the two the, liter the two? with the SCR. And that, that, that's that an important point. Fixed. The SCR, of course, being the urea that gets injected right. in it, you know. So if you own one of those, you could still sell it back and get your money and, and the additional money on top of it or you could keep it and get it fixed. And they are still attempting to try to fix the others. Now, who knows if they'll ever get there. You know, they've had a year and a half now to work on this thing. And, and here's, here's the other part of this, is that Judge Breyer out there has said, look, you cannot take these back and ship them to San Diego or someplace and then have them wind up in Guadalajara or in Bangalore or you know, God knows where. The, the only thing that I see there is that these cars are going to have to be dismantled. Yeah, scrapped. And they're going to have Crushed. to be scrapped. Right. I don't see yeah. how they fix them. So, so, so yeah. does, does Volkswagen sell any diesels in this market? No. Here, let me uh, synthesize the, all of that and say, and a <laughs> chance in hell. <laughs> and and, they, and, and they basically kind of ruined it just about yeah, for, for everybody just about else. Everybody. Four cars. Yeah. I think that SUVs can sort of hang on. And pickups. And pickups. But cars, I mean, I guess Chevy's still trying, but... With the cruise yeah. diesel? Yeah, but I don't not think much it's... else. No. And they're putting it in so. something else, too, right? Malibu? or, or I the thought they were, the diesel was going in another car. I thought it was just Colorado and, and cruise. Okay, maybe I'm wrong on that. 
What do you, what do you think the final fallout is going to be for them here? Whether or not they're selling cars or not. Volkswagen. You mean. Yeah. See, my my forecast on this has been way in excess of the number that it's been out there. I've been looking at a, at a hundred million, a hundred billion dollars. What is it now? This. Twenty. Well, I mean, that's just U.S. Though. I know. You know, right. It's just you and, and that doesn't even look at. And that's uh, just the civil, not the criminal. Correct. On top of it. Correct. So then you've got, and, and that's what I wondered to get back to your original premise between Piak and, and, and Wintercorn. Is someone trying to save their behind right now on a criminal charge? They're willing to go ahead and take the civil charge in the German courts, but he doesn't want to be making little ones out of big ones in the Bavarian Alps. You know, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, you know, this is not good. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, so I, th I think that, uh, that remember that the, the European greens make our greens look like rookies. I mean, they, they got some really devout green guys over there. And as we've seen in a number of other applications from other countries who are saying, well, wait a minute, how come the Americans got this $20 billion uh, total that's going on there, plus the criminal charge, and you're offering me $3 billion. How come I'm not getting more of that? And I've got more product here. So we did have stricter emission standards. Yeah, but they're, so, we'll see. they're yeah. more vindictive. <laughs> Could be. So yeah. You don't have an ex-wife. You don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't want that. <laughs> yeah, well, clearly this story is far from over. And now we're starting, we're going to get into the juicy stuff. Because to your Paul, point, Paul, uh, right around the corner is the criminal charges. Yeah. And, and the lawsuits. So, yeah, this story is far from over. I'm, I'm still sticking with $100 billion. You can take away half of a company's market cap, and you got to, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. And, you know, as Volkswagen has announced this very ambitious plan to bring out all kinds of electric cars and plug-ins, that's going to be a big bill. I wonder if they're seriously going to have the money to be able to do that. Well, they did know, manage to become the world's number one automaker last year while having all these issues. Mm -hmm. Well, part of it shows just how weak they are in the U.S. market because they were largely unaffected in almost every other market in the world, save South Korea, where a couple of VW execs were tossed in the clink. And uh, I believe they did uh, stop sales of all cars. Anyway, I, I should all I should say is South Korea is the only other country that's cracked down so far. So. In China, which is now Volkswagen's biggest market by far, they don't sell very many diesels. This has been a none issue in China whatsoever. And in Europe, I mean, people are complaining, but they're still buying diesels there. So speaking of China, no, do you guys... Nobody says you guys... they're bad engines. They're wonderful engines. Yeah. You know, they're, uh, they cough still a little dirty. <laughs> so, so mentioning China, do you guys see the possibility of, of Chinese companies coming to the U.S. market being the big market that it is? Um, of course, at some point. Sure. But is, Do is, you, in this sense, we have a new president, and he's talking about slapping a big import tariff on cars coming in. He's really saber-rattling against China. China throws a 25% tariff on everything that's imported. In fact, for a while there, they were adding an extra 10% on top of any car made in America because they accused the American government of subsidizing the auto industry when they bailed out Chrysler and GM. So I could see a Trump going, okay, you got a 25% tariff on our cars, we're gonna put one of them on you. And oh, by the way, you make all the foreigners find a Chinese joint venture partner and they can't be a majority owner in that. That sounds like a good idea for us too. I, I wonder now, What's really going to happen? Because I don't know what Trump's really going to do. He says a lot of stuff, but what's the final regulation or law going to be? But if I were Chinese companies, I'd be rethinking my plans right now. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends. I mean, how long Trump is around, he won't be at, at most of the year eight years. Right. So they and like you said, uh, the 51 49 uh, partnership that they all automatically have, which teaches them how to build cars. So they are automatically going to get better at building cars and have been for 10 or 15 years with those partnerships. So we are going to get, they're going to get better to the point where they're going to be able to build cars well enough to bring them here. Now, 
when that's going to be. They said it would be 2010. Yeah, so I mean, we said we, we how long have we been saying that? Yeah. So it could be 2030. It could be well, you know, Link and Co, which is part of Geely, has said 2019 they're going to be here. Okay. Well, yeah, that's hard that's, to believe. Yeah. That's a couple of years yeah. away. But yeah. Sooner or later, when, when I was involved in this show, in the management of this show, I can remember 15 years ago when those guys were coming and knocking on our door for space and wanting to come here because we're going to be here in 08 or 09. Yeah, yeah. They didn't look at our emission or safety regulations when they said that. And that was a huge hurdle for them to overcome. They've got to figure it figured out now. But I, I wonder, I think. Uh, there's a new game in town, and as all this mobility rollout thing happens where maybe people stop buying cars or most people stop buying cars and start buying mobility, I, the window to get into this market is right now. You know, you go past 2020, who knows what's going to happen? I think it's that much more difficult to try to get in at well, that what, point. What is that market then? Because we see all these automakers going into these car sharing service situations and if we're building autonomous cars and having and putting them together with car sharing services maybe people aren't even buying cars they're buying shares in a car sharing service yeah. and that's how automakers are selling cars in the future I don't own a car I own a, a subscription to a car sharing service and mine is GM or Mercedes or whoever it is. So, so what's your what's your sense of a time frame for that? I mean, is that going to be in 20 years, 15, 10? I think they're looking a lot. Well, maybe more like 10 than 20. I, I think. I, I'm, I'd flip that around. I think more like 20 than 10. I, I think that people still want to own something, and and while it's moving that way, you can't argue with that. I don't know. I, I, I don't think the whole market is that way, obviously, yeah. but some people will go that way. I mean, Cadillac just introduced something like that already. A right? subscription service that you can basically mm -hmm. pay yeah, a monthly $1, fee. 1500 bucks a month, and it's in New York right, right. now. Right, right. But, uh, um, yeah, so where, where, does that, where does that leave automakers for, as far as sales go? And, and then when you add autonomy into that, uh, I mean, it gets, it gets really you know, strange. Our, our, our crystal balls get clouded sometimes because, you know, remember it was 10 years ago that we were talking about how, how strong hybrids and, and pure electrics were going to come along, and 10 years ago it was 2% of the market. And now here we are 10 years later, after 10 years worth of indoctrination and technology advancements and everything else, and everybody saying, this is it, this is it, this is it, we still got the same percentage of, of demand. It was, I think we just saw it was 2.2, now it's 2.8. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Of course, it was a much bigger number because that was a 10 million market, now we're a 17 million yeah. market. Yeah. But it's still, it's not a lot. Right. Yeah. Well, right. speaking of crystal balls, if we have autonomous vehicles and we have these subscription services, what happens to car shows? Oh. I, th I think car shows do just fine, and and I think that there's a, a connect to them. Yeah, everybody, everybody you know talks about what what's done at CES, and is uh, Detroit worried about CES? Yeah, I guess so. You know, from uh, a standpoint of uh, the number of intros that they get there and the the kind of product that they do, but I still think that people want to come out and connect with it. And this is the best way to do it, and it's it's everything under one roof. Uh, I don't know. I, I still see them as viable for a while, at least. If you're looking at what what subscription service you want to get into, maybe you, you're sitting in different pods, you know? <laughs> this is the pod that I like. I think you're right. Mm -hmm. I think you're right, Kirk. I, I, I don't think interest in cars is going to go away. It's going to be different, very different than anything that we've ever experienced, but... <clears throat> You know, people loved their horses when it was horses. Now they love their cars. In the future, I think they'll love their mobility service. It's all about what gets me from here to there in the greatest style, the greatest comfort, the greatest ease, and or the lowest price. Best connectivity, best comfort, you know, whatever, ease, easiest. Yeah. Are we the right guys to, ask that, to answer that question now? You know, because we're all so emotionally involved in the business yeah, anyway. Yeah. I, don't want, I don't want that future. Yeah. Yeah. I want to well, drive a 911. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With none of that technology <laughs> on it. I swear in German. Yeah. <laughs> hey, good. With that, we ought to wrap this up. Let's make a promise and come back in another decade and do this again, and we'll find out if we were right or wrong or God what. God willing, we'll do that. That's right. That's good.
So, Paul Bryan, Kirk Bell, thanks for stopping by on Autoline After Hours. And Gary, we'll do it again next week. Let's go back to the, studio. the studio. Yeah. And who do we have? Uh, Tom Gould of Adiant. He's, Adiant. Uh, head of the design um, team over there. Yeah, so. we, we talked to a lot of designers at car companies. Now we'll get a chance to talk to a designer at a supplier. An interior company, yes. Yeah, real good. With that, we're signing off. Hope to see you all next week. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Visit our website, autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with AutoLine Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with AutoLine This Week. There's all that and much more at AutoLine.tv.